Hello everybody, welcome. I think we're just waiting, a few more people just uh, entering. Um, so we're just uh, waiting for everybody to get into the call. Um, welcome, this is a Campbell Collaboration um, webinar. Um, it's great to see so many people here. So I'm Jo thompson Coon. I'm uh, based at the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. And um, I'm editor and um, co-editor of the Aging Group within um, Campbell. And today's uh, seminar is going to be given by Olivia Magwood. Olivia is an early career researcher based at the Bria Institute at the University um, in Ottawa. Uh, she's also a PhD candidate at the University of Ottawa. Um, Olivia's work is around um, equity in health decision making. Um, she conducts empirical methods research on what equity data are needed in reviews and how to apply reviews for evidence informed equity orientated policy. Um, today, she is going to be talking to us about stakeholder engagement in evidence synthesis. So, welcome, Olivia. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you for that nice introduction and thank you everyone for joining us today. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are joining from. Um, like Joe said, my name is Olivia. I'm based in Ottawa, where I work very closely with a group called the Multi-Stakeholder Engagement Consortium, or MUSE. And so today what I'd like to do is present to you all an update about what we have been uh, doing in MUSE and provide you with some initial guidance for stakeholder engagement in evidence synthesis. We thought this would be particularly appealing to many of the groups of the Campbell Collaboration who are gaining more interest in incorporating different stakeholder perspectives into their reviews. And so to begin, I'll offer a little introduction to the MUSE Consortium. Uh, so we're an international group of collaborators and researchers. Um, there's over 120 of us in the collaboration right now. And we all came together in 2015 over a common interest for stakeholder engagement in research and in clinical practice guidelines. And so we've been working together for a few years to develop international guidance that's of use to guideline producers, systematic review authors, and systematic and guideline commissioners. Our group currently has two funded projects. The initial one that was just coming to a close focused on stakeholder engagement in guideline development, which is set to finish off this year. And then our current initiative, which is stakeholder engagement in evidence synthesis. And this is what I'm really keen to speak to you all about today. Uh, here on the slide, you see our most recent team photo. Um, unfortunately, the COVID pandemic kept us from meeting in person for such a long time. And luckily in September, we were able to gather a small group of us. And so that's the photo you see on the slide. Um, in our most recent MUSE initiative, we interacted with over 200 individuals from over 30 countries around the world. We do aim to kind of engage people globally, and we're actively working on engaging people coming from low and middle income countries. Although to date, we are still highly concentrated in high income countries, particularly in Canada, the US, the UK and Australia. However, we do have a number of organizations that are kind of on board with us, and you may recognize some of the logos here on the screen, particularly the Campbell Collaboration, Cochrane, Grade, WHO. So these are all pretty popular commissioners and producers of systematic reviews and evidence-based guidelines. So to get us started, I'd like to go over some of the definitions that we use within the MUSE Consortium, um, beginning with stakeholders. You'll notice that in our name, the Multi-Stakeholder Engagement Consortium, we use the term stakeholders to describe an individual or group who is responsible for or affected by health or healthcare related decisions. And we have developed a, an 11 P's framework to help us remember all of the different stakeholder groups that might be relevant to an evidence synthesis project. Unsurprisingly, you'll see, you know, patients, caregivers and patient organizations listed here, as well as researchers and principal investigators that often work together. 
but we've also got nine other groups listed that are not always engaged as often as we'd like to see. This includes members of the public, healthcare providers, policymakers, and other decision makers. We've got program managers, payers of research or funders, as well as the payers of the health service, uh, product makers, and peer review editors. And in presenting this In presenting this framework, we're actually hoping to kind of uh, encourage people to think a little bit broader than just patients or just healthcare providers to consider other perspectives from people who work within the health system and who might need to develop recommendations um, related to health or healthcare. That being said, there's actually been a lot of discussion within our group recently about the term stakeholders. Um, particularly in the Canadian context and in a colonial context, a stakeholder was traditionally a person who drove a stake into the land to demarcate the land they were occupying from Indigenous people. And so increasingly we're realizing that continuous use of this term can be construed as very disrespectful to Indigenous people, and it's actually perpetuating colonization and re-traumatization. And so uh, currently this month, the MUSE Consortium is working on rebranding and uh, developing a new term that we could use to better reflect the groups that we want to speak about. So we've already come up with a list of options based on um, some recommendations from the consortium as well as a literature review. And some of these options I've put on the slide, such as partners or knowledge users and constituents. We're aiming to find a more neutral term without a negative connotation that we could use to adequately describe stakeholder groups. However, we have not yet made this decision. And in fact, we are actively seeking uh, recommendations and suggestions for better terms that we could be using. And if this is of interest to you and you'd like to give us your opinion, um, I welcome you to actually uh, participate in this very short survey that we have here. Um, what it is is an option for you to provide us with recommendations on terms for, that could replace the word stakeholder in our initiative. I've included a QR code on the slide, but I've also asked for the link to be dropped directly in the chat for you. So you're welcome to fill this out on a mobile device or online. But if you have some suggestions, we would really welcome them. Today is the first day that this survey is being launched, and we need to make a decision within the next couple of weeks. So we welcome any suggestions that you may have. Uh, moving on from our definition of stakeholders, I'd now like to just kind of spend a couple of minutes defining what we mean by engagement, because this term also varies depending on the context that you're working in, the country, or the specific research field. And so as part of the MUSE Consortium, we're defining engagement as an active partnership between stakeholders and researchers in the production of new healthcare knowledge and evidence. And this actually results in informed decision making about the selection of research, the conduct of research, and how it is ultimately used. However, we recognize that, you know, different terms exist, and so other words that you might hear of that also mean engagement to us is collaboration, involvement, or partnership. And so you'll see some of this language also throughout my slide deck. Uh, so where does this terminology come from? You might be familiar with Arnstein's Ladder of Participation, which we have here on the left, which essentially suggests that the lowest rungs are those in which uh, individuals or group might be manipulated or coerced into participating in research or healthcare initiatives. And then as we move up the ladder, these individuals then hold more power over the research initiative. Um, within the MUSE Consortium, we have actually simplified this framework uh, to really focus on two levels of engagement that a researcher might consider applying at any given moment during a project. And really what it comes down to is, are you asking these individuals to help you make a decision and have an equal vote at the table? Or are you asking them to provide advice or feedback that you would then consider in your decision making? So really here, we're just trying to offer two practical options for how and what level of engagement you might offer a stakeholder who's participating in your evidence synthesis work. 
Now we can move on to, you know, why engage stakeholders in evidence synthesis at all? We often see this as a very long term and technical process, and it's often difficult to understand why you might want to engage stakeholders within this process. But what we found is that, you know, there is a lot of there are a lot of barriers to the uptake of evidence, particularly by decision makers who need to use that evidence to inform policy or to inform practice or decision making. And the engagement of stakeholders within an evidence synthesis process can actually help us overcome some of these barriers. It can ensure that the evidence synthesis product is more relevant and attuned to the needs of stakeholders and that it's actually answering a meaningful question. In return, the stakeholders are also more aware of what the evidence says and how it can be used, and this will promote uptake into research or policy and hopefully have a greater impact down the line. And one area that is of particular interest to myself is the impact on health equity. And I really love this quote that says, the insights that stakeholders provide are the only key to ethical decision-making. And we really need these uh, in order to address inequities. And so within our MUSE consortium group, we've begun to think about uh, factors that you might want to consider when you're trying to identify individuals to invite them to engage with you in a multi-stakeholder research partnership. And so Roses Parker and her colleagues in the UK have come up with this list of highly desirable and desirable factors that any researcher should consider before you begin to invite people to your team. Firstly, we need to ensure that whoever it is that we're inviting has the ability and willingness to represent their stakeholder group. They need to remember that they are not there just on behalf of themselves, but behalf of the people that they represent. They also need commitment and time capacity to, in order to uh, be involved. And within an evidence synthesis product, this often means that we might need them either on a very rapid basis, if we're doing a rapid review, but potentially also on a long-term basis, as very complex reviews can take a year or 18 months to really sort out from beginning to end. As always, with any project, you need to reflect on what the conflicts of interest might be. And this is particularly important if you're thinking about engaging with product makers or other folks who might have some kind of financial or intellectual conflict of interest. And they also need to have relevant experience and expertise. So you need to reflect on whether or not you are inviting them as a content expert or whether or not you are asking them to participate in more technical aspects of a review. You also need to keep in mind their training and support needs, recognizing that different stakeholders might require different levels of support or training in order to meaningfully participate. This might mean offering uh, tailored training sessions on how to complete a review or offering them, you know, check in points for support along the way. And there's one item on this list that I'd actually really like to spend some time thinking about because this is something I get asked really frequently is, you know, how can we ensure that we're being inclusive, how, that we're being, you know, reflective about equity and diversity. And so I've kind of integrated some of these ideas into this presentation today. Uh, the first kind of resource that I'd like to highlight are the progress plus uh, equity and diversity characteristics. You may be familiar with the Progress Plus acronym. It's also um, highlighted in a lot of the work of the Cochrane and Campbell Equity Methods Group. And it's used to identify characteristics that stratify health opportunities and outcomes. So we use the Progress um, acronym to think about place of residence, race or ancestry, occupation, gender, religion, education, socioeconomic status, and social capital. And the plus within this acronym also refers to additional personal characteristics associated with discrimination or features of relationships or time dependent relationships um, that might lead somebody to be temporarily at a disadvantage. And the reason I'm sharing this is that it's very important when you're putting together your team for an evidence synthesis product that you think about some of these characteristics and whether or not people from certain characteristics or identities could meaningfully contribute to your work. This doesn't mean that you need to, you know, include people that tick off all of these boxes, but it really is a prompt for you to reflect on which characteristics might be influential. 
To build on this, I wanted to share some of the recent work coming from McMaster University. So they have a public and patient collaborative and a public engagement in health policy team. And just recently, they have published a compendium of resources to help people in supporting their equity centered engagement work. And I think it's such a nice uh, tool to have and very timely. It was only released a couple of weeks ago. And so they offer five prompting questions and a series of resources for people to take a look at. And I've summarized these prompting questions here. Uh, so first, it's really important to consider how you plan to center equity in your engagement work. And there are several things to consider, including having a thorough understanding of equity and what this means, and it's relevant to engagement and reflecting on your own roles and positions within the engagement process. So this is really acting, asking us to be quite reflective into you know, what positions that we already hold before we begin to invite stakeholders to join us. Next, we ask, you know, how do we plan for engagement that centers equity? And so when planning our engagement work, we need to center equity by carefully considering who and why we want to engage. We need to build relationships uh, with these individuals or with these groups and to build an understanding of the communities that we want to engage with us, as well as setting our own goals for engagement. So we need to reflect right at the beginning as to what is it that we want to achieve by engaging folks in our work. Next, we ask, you know, how do we connect with our population of interest for engagement? And so once you are equipped with an understanding of who your population is and why you wish to engage them, you'll need to consider how to connect with them. And so this involves establishing relationships that are built on trust, ensuring that we're reaching a correct diversity of voices, and thinking about the barriers to their engagement and working towards reducing those barriers. For some people, that might be financial compensation, that could be offering childcare services um, in order for parents to be involved. Um, there are lots of facilitators that could be considered here. Next, we ask, you know, what engagement strategies can we use to foster equity in engagement? And demonstrating an ongoing commitment to equity centered principles throughout the engagement process requires us to ensure that our participants or our stakeholders feel safe, respected and valued while simultaneously addressing power imbalances that may arise. So we need to constantly be checking in and reflecting, making sure that people feel safe and comfortable enough to really share their perspectives with us and to see that their work is being reflected. Uh, in the evidence synthesis product that we're working on. And then finally, we ask, you know, well, how will we continue to foster equity after our engagement is complete? And after we've completed any engagement activity, we need to do further work to uphold these principles of equity. And so this might include, you know, following up with our stakeholders, maintaining those long term relationships, ensuring that we have truly acted on the input that they have provided to us and committing to learning and improving our engagement work. I think if my engagement work has taught me anything over the past couple of years is that there's always room for growth and improvement and opportunities to see where we may have messed up and where we can do better in the future. Now, even if your project does not aim to be, you know, completely equity centered, there's still a list of basic principles and values that could apply to any research partnership. And here on the slide, I've shared um, one of my favorite publications at the moment on principles and strategies of research partnerships. And what they've done is they've done a very large overview of reviews, looking for values, principles and strategies to support engagement in research partnerships. And here on the slide, I've presented kind of the summary principles for us to consider, but you'll notice that so much of this overlaps with what is considered to be equity centered engagement. Thinking about our relationship and how it is we work together, thinking about how it is that we commu communicate with one another and developing opportunities for bi directional capacity building and learning. Now, 
You may at this point be wondering, well, if all of that applies to any research partnership, what is it that exists that's specific to evidence synthesis and to conducting systematic reviews? And so here on the slide, I have the active framework. So this was developed by Alex Todd Hunter Brown and her colleagues uh, a couple of years ago. And they developed this really helpful guide <clears throat> for authors on how to involve stakeholders in a systematic review process. Essentially what this guide does is it helps, it helps review authors think about who you have involved, how you've recruited them to be involved in your systematic review, and what kind of approach or the mode of involvement. It also asks us to think about, you know, at which stage of the review process do we want to involve them? And at each stage, what kind of power, what kind of level of involvement did we give these folks? The active framework proposes a continuum of involvement based on the specific tasks or roles of the stakeholders. And it also adds to the existing guidance for reporting. So currently for reporting of stakeholder engaged work, we mostly only have one generic type of reporting guideline called GRIP2. And the active framework really helps fill this gap in you know, specific reporting for systematic reviews. And while the active framework paints us this really nice initial picture of who we might consider to engage and when, um, there are a few limitations of using the framework. Particularly, it has a big focus on the engagement of patients, carers, and their families, and then lumps all other stakeholders into an other stakeholder kind of label. This is something that the MUSE Consortium is actually looking to expand on, since we think that there are up to 11 different types of stakeholder groups that should be included in a systematic review. We're actually looking to kind of uh, develop this guidance a little bit further and offer guideline authors or systematic review authors different options for who to engage, methods for their engagement, and different tasks or activities within a systematic review process that they could participate in. And this brings me to the most recent work of the MUSE Consortium. So we currently have obtained funding um, for a multi-year project to develop guidance and build on the active framework to help review authors understand who they should be involving within a systematic review or a scoping review, um, helping develop adequate reporting guidelines so that review authors know how to report who was engaged and what they participated in as well as continuous thinking about how can uh, stakeholder engagement be evaluated during this process. And so uh, within this larger project, we aim to conduct five of our own reviews. So these will focus on the methods for stakeholder engagement, barriers and facilitators to engagement, conflict of interest considerations while you are engaging stakeholders in this work. We're also going to do a review on impact and on equity considerations. Um, and currently we're right at the initial planning phases of these projects where we are actively developing the protocols with our stakeholders. So what is so fabulous about working with the MUSE Consortium is every project and every step has stakeholder representatives from these stakeholder groups. And they advise us on what components or what it is they would like to see in our projects. And this really helps ensure that even our own guidance is something that review authors will use and other stakeholders will use or be interested in following. After we've completed our own reviews, we also plan to do a series of surveys and key informant interviews. And the purpose of these will really be to nail, uh, nail down some of the items that should appear in our final guidance and in the potential reporting guideline. We then plan on having a couple of multi-stakeholder consensus activities in the form of meetings and workshops to help us develop the final guidance document. And then finally work towards dissemination. So presentations at academic conferences and academic publications, but also doing wider KT and outreach to other groups. And so, Something that the current MUSE project aims to do is to think about when can we engage stakeholders throughout all steps of a systematic review or an evidence synthesis. 
And this begins at the very early planning stages. So the pre-review stages where we might think about setting our priorities and topic selection or acquiring funding to do the work, all the way through those very technical steps such as searching, data collection, selection, right through to writing and publishing. So we have a lot of different steps to think about, and we recognize that you know, different stakeholders might have different skills or different interest levels in participating in some of these activities. And so one thing that our project aims to do is be very responsive and reflective about what stakeholders' preferences are. And this is why we actually involve a lot of stakeholders in our work to really hear about their preferences and when they truly want to be engaged and when they think that their energy is better left elsewhere. And we know that there are many, many different ways that stakeholders can be engaged at any given step of a review. Here on the slide, I've presented kind of four options or four examples, but we think that there are probably many more options. And so we hope that the work of the Muse Consortium that we're currently working on uh, can help us identify more of these strategies so that we can produce guidance or options for review authors to consider in their work. Some of the ideas that we've already come up with are integrating different stakeholders as re complete review team members, meaning that they are a co-author on the work, that they participate in all of the steps of a systematic review. However, there are also options to form steering or advisory committees that are comprised of multiple stakeholder groups that can then provide some kind of guidance or strategic decision-making for a technical review team. There are also different options um, for one-time engagement with stakeholder groups, such as conducting surveys or perhaps a multiple round Delphi, as well as doing workshops or community consultations to find out what is most important to stakeholders. We're thinking that most of these ideas and more will end up in the final guidance produced by the Muse Consortium in a few years. And I thought to really, you know, bring this all to life, I would share an example um, from a recent systematic review process that I participated in. And this is actually the project that set off my initial interest um, in the stakeholder engagement world, and particularly, you know, how can we involve stakeholders in systematic reviews and guidelines. And so between 2017 and 2020, there was a Canadian team that was put together that aimed to develop Canada's first clinical practice guideline for the care of people with lived experience of homelessness. And uh, as part of the guideline development process, we identified the need to, to complete several systematic reviews. And we thought about, you know, how can we ensure that the review evidence and the recommendations that we come up with are very reflective and attuned to the needs of people experiencing homelessness. And so within our team, we had a big commitment towards equity, towards equitable engagement, and ensuring that the recommendations that we came up with were equity focused. And so what we opted to do is we launched what we called a community scholar program. Essentially what this was, was an opportunity for individuals who represented our population of interest to join us as co-researchers alongside us in the systematic reviews that we were conducting. What this means is that we recruited a few people with lived experience of homelessness to join our team. And we wanted to make sure that our program was set up so that we could ensure their meaningful participation throughout the project. And built into this, we wanted to make sure that they were adequately compensated such that they were able to devote the time and energy needed to actively participate in the research uh, alongside the team members. So this is something that we thought about way at the beginning at the time of acquiring funding. We knew that this was an approach that we wanted to take and we sought out resources to support them. And so here I'd like to kind of paint a picture or tell you the story of, you know, how all these folks were engaged in our systematic review and what the impact of this was. Uh, so at the very early stages of the project was topic selection. We needed to identify which topics or which areas of interest would be most important to people with lived experience of homelessness to actually identify the eventual topics of the review and the clinical practice guideline itself. 
So what we did is we conducted a three round Delphi survey with uh, healthcare professionals and people with lived experience of homelessness across Canada. We were very fortunate to have a number of community partners who were able to help us ad administer the guideline in several provinces and languages. Overall, we engaged 84 health professionals and 76 people with lived experience of homelessness, and they helped us identify the specific topics or intervention areas that they were interested in, as well as particular populations or subgroups that they felt needed um, attention. We then launched our community scholar program and developed a protocol for a series of reviews. What this means is that we actually had input from people with lived experience of homelessness into the full step of protocol development. So this included developing our questions and using the PICO framework, developing our inclusion criteria and outcomes of interest, as well as providing us with examples of search terms or words um, to help us identify all of the relevant literature. And these folks were embedded within the review team. They appear as co-authors on the protocol and they appear as co-authors on the eventual reviews. We had a number of technical team members on our team. So these are folks that really specialize in doing systematic reviews, including you know, running the search strategy, applying the inclusion criteria and identifying which studies we should include. We then, you know, did all of the classic systematic review steps, including synthesizing the findings into meta analyses. But we then needed to think about, you know, interpretation and what does this all mean? And we felt that it was really important once again to go back to our community, go back to our stakeholders and really discuss the interpretation of the findings. So back in 2018, we hosted a one day community event that we termed the Homeless Health Summit. And we hosted this as an in-person event in Toronto, in Canada. Uh, to this event, we invited people with lived experience of homelessness. We invited policymakers and program managers. We invited researchers and physicians who work in the area. And the idea here was to really present the findings of the systematic review and offer a bit of an academic debate as to what it meant and where, where we were going with all of this particularly what does it mean for the Canadian healthcare system if we begin to recommend some of these interventions for these populations. And ultimately, we did come to uh, develop a set of evidence-based recommendations, which we then carried forward, and people with lived experience of homelessness were also highly involved in the dissemination and the uptake of our, our results. So we ended up completing an additional community-based study where we asked people uh, in shelters um, what kind of implementation factors they thought we should be considering when looking at these recommendations. We also brought it to the actual decision makers, the healthcare providers, asking them what they thought. We then published a clinical practice guideline as well as 13 academic publications. And on all of these publications, several stakeholders, including people with lived experience of homelessness, appear as co-authors and are also acknowledged in the work. They were also instrumental in some of our initial dissemination activities, including, you know, radio interviews or attending conferences or other community presentations. And at each stage, we really wanted to highlight the how important it was for these folks to be engaged in this work and the impact that they've had. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, this work was launched on the 9th of May 2020, just about a couple of days before the entire world shut down. And so we have actually been reflecting on, you know, what that meant for the impact of the project and whether or not, you know, some additional activities should be uh, thought of right now to kind of revive the work, because we felt that it was so important and so much effort had gone into it. And then unfortunately, you know, other priorities came into play at the time. And here I just have placed a couple of examples of some of the published evidence syntheses that were co-created and co-produced with these groups. And what I'd like to highlight here is that all of these reviews, they're not all true intervention reviews. Some of them are your classic intervention review, but we also completed overviews of reviews, 
scoping reviews, and qualitative evidence syntheses. So I think it really demonstrates that um, you can engage stakeholders in a wide array of systematic review types or different types of evidence synthesis products, and that you know there's always some opportunity for them to feed into the final work. Um, now I'd just like to spend a moment, you know, reflecting on uh, evaluation, because I think you know, this isn't something that we often do during a systematic review process. We often don't evaluate our own processes and our own works. We're often happy to just publish the review and move on. Um, but I think it's so important for us to not only evaluate our work, but also publish on those evaluations so that other people can learn from them. And one gap that we're seeing in the literature right now is a true lack of, you know, empirical impact evaluations about stakeholder engagement. And so there's a great movement towards thinking about how can we engage people, but also how can we evaluate that engagement. And so on the slide, I've shared two resources that uh, we use and we are considering. The first is the Patient Engagement in Research Scale, or PEERS, that is specifically designed um, for engagement in research. And you also have the Public and Patient Engagement Evaluation Tool. Both of these are Canadian resources, but they have applicability to many, many, um, not only research product projects, um, but the PEPEAT tool is also um, highlighted to be used by anybody working within the health system. So this could also include priority setting or other types of engagement not related to research. And I've shared these specifically to encourage people to more actively think about evaluation when they're doing stakeholder engaged work. And so here I've just outlined some of these, the take home messages that I'd really like to express from this presentation. The first is that engaging stakeholders in an evidence synthesis can improve the relevance and uptake of the review evidence. It is such a great facilitator to overcoming barriers to the use of evidence by decision makers. And it also helps us ensure that the evidence that we are creating is truly reflective of the needs of the populations that we're trying to influence. Within the MUSE consortium, we've identified 11 types of stakeholder groups that we think review teams should consider. It doesn't mean that all 11 need to be involved in every evidence synthesis project, but we want to encourage people to think beyond just the systematic review team, you know, those technical team members, and to think beyond patient and caregiver engagement, to really think about all the actors within the health system that might have, a, you know, some kind of value in using this evidence or, um, engaging with it. We also recognize that, you know, stakeholders can be engaged with varying levels of intensity in many steps of an evidence synthesis project, and that this level of engagement can change throughout the project life cycle. So you may require, you know, a higher intensity or level of engagement at early stages, then people might drop off for a few moments and then come back. I think something that I learned from my own work is that we need to be adaptive, we need to be uh, responsive to stakeholder needs and the time that they are available to contribute to projects. Finally, review authors should commit to a set of principles or values to guide their own engagement work and also consider whether equity-centered engagement is relevant for their research context. So particular project teams might have an additional emphasis on equity, depending on the population that they're working with or their specific goals in relation to the evidence review. Within the MUSE consortium, we aim to produce guidance for review authors on who should be engaged in an evidence synthesis and when and how they should be engaged. And this is something that we're going to be working on for the next two years or so. And so if this is something that is of interest to you, here on the slide, I've placed the contact information for Jennifer Petkovich. She is the coordinator of our group. And so if you are interested in joining the MUSE Consortium and being involved in some of the upcoming work, this is actually a great moment to do so. We're just at the beginning of launching our current reviews on this topic, and we're always looking for additional help or additional expertise in the area. So if this is of interest to you, please go ahead and uh, contact Jennifer. You can also visit our website, which is currently hosted on the Cochrane and Campbell Equity Methods Group website, or follow us on Twitter to follow us uh, to hear about some updates. 
And with that, I'd like to, you know, open up the floor to questions. I'm really passionate about this and hopefully you are too. And so I'd be happy to answer any questions or, you know, have a bit of a discussion about it. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. That was amazing. Um, so clear and you've covered so much, uh, so much ground. Um, do we have any questions? Um, please feel free to put your cameras on and um, speak your question or pop them in the chat and um, whatever is easier. Um, I know it sometimes takes a little while for questions to come through on the chat. Um, okay, maybe I should start us off. And hopefully this isn't too tricky. Um, so one of the things we um, sometimes struggle with is stakeholder engagement is, um, I think it's quite easy to create, um, or relatively easy to create an atmosphere where your stakeholders agree with what you're doing. Um, it's quite easy to feel at the end of the meeting, perhaps that you've had some meaningful engagement and especially it all feels great if everyone said, oh yes, this is exactly right. Um, but how do you have any um, sort of tips or strategies around creating a, a space where people can say, actually, no, this isn't how you should be doing it. And um, people feel, feel supported to kind of disagree with the researchers. Such a great question. And I think that really points to the need to be, you know, continuously reflecting on how it is that we're doing engagement. And what I particularly like about some of the evaluation tools that I shared in the presentation is that you don't need to evaluate your engagement only at the beginning and the end of an initiative. I think having continuous opportunities for stakeholders to reflect on how they're being engaged and what it is that they like is so important. And so I've done this differently in a couple of different projects, depending on who it is that we're engaging and the different ways that we choose to do it. Um, but one thing that we found quite helpful is, especially in recent years, given that everything is virtual, you know, offering quick and easy opportunities to gather feedback from our stakeholders at the time that we're giving are doing an engagement activity. So during workshops, we might try to offer some polls or little questions for stakeholders to reflect on, such as, do you feel that you've been given an adequate opportunity to express yourself or your opinions? Do you feel that the project team is receptive to your opinions and do you feel that you're being meaningfully engaged? Do you see your impact or your suggestions in the final product? So do you think that they're actually being taken into account? And I think, you know, thinking about these questions and offering stakeholders the opportunity to give you in real time a little bit of feedback as to how your engagement efforts are going is so important especially when you consider how long a review can take or any stakeholder engaged piece of work can take. Making sure that we're always open to learning and to adaptation, I think is something that a review team needs to be willing to do, I think, if they want to do good stakeholder engaged work. Thank you. So we've got some questions coming through on the chat now. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to speak about their question or I can read them or you can read them, Olivia. I don't know. So say that you, um, you would prefer to answer. Um, we may have too many to do all of them. Um, what criteria do you use to select and engage stakeholders? Is that when you... Yeah, so I'm seeing a question here from David, who says, thanks for the wonderful presentation. What criteria do you use to select and engage stakeholders that you engage in your projects? And I think this is such a fabulous question, um, because in truth, this changes depending on the specific review or the specific project that we're trying to do. And so we usually try to begin with these factors that I've put back on the slide. Um, which are kind of those broader criteria before you might invite somebody to participate in a research partnership. Um, so initially we might think about, you know, what kind of populations or what kind of groups do we want to engage with? So we'll begin with our 11 P's framework, identifying stakeholder groups. And depending on the time or resources that you have available to you, you could do quite an extensive or formal stakeholder analysis or a stakeholder mapping exercise. And when doing that type of exercise, you might think about, you know, within the space or within the context of whatever intervention it is that you're studying, who is it that has power in these situations? Who is it that makes decisions based on the evidence that you produce? Who is it that has influence in that space 
But I also encourage people to think about, well, who is being underrepresented in this space, whose voices are often maybe not heard in that particular policy or practice area, um, so that we're really being reflective as to, you know, giving a voice to people who are, are typically underserved or typically not, you know, engaged in this type of work. So I like to start there with a little bit of stakeholder mapping and then bringing it to thinking about these factors. So making sure that whoever it is that we're involving is able to represent a constituency and they're aware of the community needs. They need to be able to kind of take on this perspective of I am bigger than just myself, I am representing a group. Um, and making sure that we have like, you know, the tools and the resources in place to support them. Uh, depending on your topic, there are other kind of skills that you might be looking for. For example, if you already have a very strong systematic review technical team, perhaps it's not as important that your stakeholders arrive with existing skills in evidence based medicine or systematic reviewing. But if you're putting together a very new team and perhaps those aren't skills that you already have, you then have this additional barrier or additional consideration of you're looking for people who might have previous experience in this area, who may have previously been involved in this type of work. And so there isn't one, um, one answer. Um, it's quite adaptive. And so some of the uh, guidance that the MUSE Consortium aims to give out in the next couple of years is going to be offering review authors with options to consider. So it won't be completely prescriptive, but we hope to provide you with some guidance on here are some criteria for identifying people. Here are different areas where people can be engaged. Here are different methods or approaches for their engagement to kind of present review authors with a bit of a menu to select from. Thank you. Um, I can see we've had another great question, which is about time, uh, time and resource. So um, our experience to engage stakeholders in systematic reviews is time consuming. Do you have any suggestions to engage stakeholders in time bound projects such as rapid reviews? Such a great question. And I think, you know, that hits one of the biggest barriers that we see constantly reported, not only in the literature, but among the teams that we work with. Um, so I think something that any review group needs to be aware of is that doing stakeholder engaged work is time consuming, and it probably will take more time than if you had done the review or any evidence synthesis product on your own or without engaging additional stakeholders. So certainly it's uh, time is such a valuable resource and something that we're so limited in that this is something that needs to be taken into consideration. Now rapid reviews, that's quite a unique context because often they're trying to be very responsive to some kind of urgent issue or a policy priority or practice priority. And so rather than being on the scale of months or years, we might have only weeks to do this kind of work. In cases such as this, um, some th things that we've identified as being potential facilitators is accessing uh, existing groups, existing collaborations that already represent um, a particular stakeholder group. So for example, this might be going to patient councils or citizen panels that are already established because we know that those folks who are sitting on those panels already are familiar with representing a patient group or representing the views of different people. And so trying to figure out, you know, what resources or what kind of stakeholder engaged resources can we already access is really critical, I think, in doing a project rapidly. Thank you. You've got a follow up question from David about um, remuneration for time, which is kind of uh, related. Such a great question. Um, so some groups, some stakeholder groups, depending on their occupational background or their professional background, they do have time built into their careers to allow them to participate in work like this. So for some groups, those more professional groups, um, we often don't worry about compensation as much. But for others, such as patients, you know, patient advocates, caregivers, members of the public, it's so important to adequately compensate them for their time because for them, you know, that peer reviewed academic publication or that conference presentation, that's not a meaningful form of compensation for them. 
So what we have done in some of the projects that I've worked on is we have built compensation into our funding agreements or requests for funding so that we can adequately compensate folks for their time. And even doing this, it needs to be done very carefully because depending on that individual, they might have restrictions as to what kind of income they can receive. For example, if somebody is already relying on social assistance, they might have caps or restrictions on it receiving income. And so a true, you know, a paycheck or a cash transfer would not always be an appropriate form of compensation for them. So this is something that we try to think up way at the beginning when we're uh, doing funding requests for to engage these people. We have to think about, you know, what kinds of compensation can they receive? So often we will actually involve representatives from some stakeholder groups in the initial planning phases of a project or in the grant submission of a project. These might not necessarily be the folks that stick with us to the very end, because as you know, the grant cycle is very, very long. <laughs> you often don't start a project for maybe a year after writing that initial proposal. But we do try to consult stakeholders very early on so that they can give us a sense of what appropriate compensation might look like and the different ways that we can offer it. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions or are there any questions that I've missed in the chat uh, that anybody would like to speak to? I see some questions about how to get involved and Vivian has so kindly shared uh, Jennifer Petkovic's email address again. So if this is of interest to you, if you want to be involved or even just stay on our mailing list to keep up with some of our updates, uh, please email Jennifer and she would be happy to add you to the list. Olivia, there's a question. Um, how do you measure the knowledge impacts due to stakeholder engagement? Now that's a tough question. This is something that we have continued to struggle with in some of our own work, um, partially because there are very few impact evaluations and of the impact evaluations that exist, they're often quite short term or immediate and we're not seeing those long term evaluations of impact. Some of the um, evaluation tools that I included in the presentation do try to touch on a little bit about knowledge and whether or not they see that knowledge has been carried forward in a project. But we aren't yet seeing um, those long term impacts, whether or not you're looking at impacts within the health system, true uptake of the systematic review work, whether or not you're actually seeing, you know, population health outcomes later on. Um, so this is a really complex and difficult topic to address. And if I'm being honest, it's not something that we have yet figured out. So within the MUSE consortium, um, working towards thinking about evaluation of stakeholder engagement and what this means on a long term is something that's really at the forefront of our thinking, but isn't something that we yet have guidance for. And so uh, I want to thank you very much for that question, because it just kind of reemphasizes the importance of continuing this work, because clearly there is a need for it. Brilliant. So um, lots of um, thank yous com coming into the chat. I think possibly we, um, if there's no further questions, it's time to thank Olivia very much for the presentation. I think there's a request to share the slides, so um, I, I should uh, maybe Ashika can can help us with that. Um, I think there's a plan to put the presentation on to the Campbell um, website at some point. Um, I've been reminded that I need to, um, well, we should all say thank you to Olivia first. So you, thank you very much. It's been a, a wonderful um, presentation. Um, uh, I think that I also need to remind everybody about the next webinar. And I think there was a slide about that, but I don't know where it is. Um, so yes. Here we are. The next one um, is going to be on the 2nd of May. And if you would like to come along to that, then please go to the um, Campbell website to register. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone, for joining today.